Hi, my name is Michael Sano. I'm Jewish and I love Israel. So if you love Israel, if you love being Jewish, or if you have an unwavering connection to the land of Israel, then you're in the right place. Welcome to the 12 Cities in Israel podcast. Shalom, shalom, shalom. Hey, what's going on? My name is Michael Sana. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the 12 Cities in Israel podcast, the only positive podcast on the state of Israel. Hey, if this is your first time watching us on YouTube, don't forget to hit the like button. Don't forget, uh, forget to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you can be uh, in the loop. When we, uh, when we put out brand new episodes. Also, if you want to take us with you, you can find us on SoundCloud, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, and on Spotify. If you're going to the gym and you just, you just got to hear my voice. Um, <laughs> oh, no, please stop his voice. It's killing me. Anyways, welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. We have a really exciting show today. We have a really... Uh, awesome subject really fun subject it, which is going to be kind of ironic with all the uh with all the not negative uh, uh subjects of of the past couple of episodes actually the past two episodes they've been on zionism and this one kind of loops in a little bit with it um in our history lesson section of the episode this one is on are you ready for it Peter Madeira, this is for you. This one is on Krav Maga, the Jewish deadly art. So that is, I am so excited about this. I've been like um, d- mulling over different concepts for uh, <laughs> for titles. The Jewish five fingers of death. The, uh, the All these kung fu like references and stuff like that. And because uh, when I was growing up... Um, on I think it was Channel Nine. Channel Nine's out of New York, out of or no, it's Secaucus. That's where uh, Channel Nine is. And Channel Nine had um, kung fu movies, and I used to just eat them up, eat them up. And it's why I wound up going. For those of you who don't know, uh, when I lived in New York, I went and met a wonderful guy from Hong Kong. Uh, Sifu Moyi, and uh, he taught me some uh, Wing Chun. So, hey, bring it. Um, anyways, that is neither here nor there. Um, but I got a request when I did the uh, the episode on sport and Olympic sport and fitness. I think I got hit with this twice from Peter about doing, hey, talk about combat sports, talk about Krav Maga. And so here we are. I'm going to talk about Krav Maga. Now, um, I have extensive notes. I have a bunch of stuff that I'm going to have. If you're watching this video, scroll down, look in the description. There's a couple of videos that I used as reference. Um, One of them is from ILTV and has Emmanuel Kadosh. What's up, girl? You are a rock star. And uh, it shows her doing some Krav Maga for the the station. So... Um, you're going to want to go and check those out. Now, Krav Maga um, is basically, it translates into uh, combat contact or contact combat. And um, the root word, um, Krav, means combat. And Maga, meaning um, contact. So, combat contact. It's really, it's funny because Krav Maga is a conflagration when do you ever get to use that word (laughs) it's a mishmash of a bunch uh of different styles it's basically all of the this sounds so condescending it's all the effective parts not to say that all the other parts of these different styles are ineffective but you're going to find out why these specific parts are effective um, in the second part of my description and little discussion about Krav Maga. Um, because in the beginning, <laughs> better sheet, um, I have to, uh, I have to talk about where it came from. And Emi Lichtenfeld. So Emi 
uh, it was born, what was he born? He was born Emrik Lichtenfeld on May 26th in Budapest, um, which is also where, um, is that right? Yeah, Theodore Herzl was from. What? Holy cow. Different times. Um, he was born in 1910 in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Now, he only lived there for a little while um, because his family, his father, moved them to Bratislav. But it wasn't Bratislav at the time. It was called Pressburg or Pozoni, which is today Bratislava. Now, Bratislava is in Slovakia, which was part of um, the Czech Republic. And the Czech Republic came into, if, if I get this wrong, don't, please, please tell me and let me know, I'll correct it. But um, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was part of the Axis during World War One. boom, World War One happened, independent states, Czechoslovakia established itself, and Bratislav was in Slovakia. I think it was, the, it's the capital of Slovakia. If I'm wrong about that, please let me know. Um, but his dad moved them and this was in, does it say, do I have when he moved them? I don't, but he was the chief inspector of the Bratislav police force. So, and he also owned a gym called the Hercules Gymnasium. And his dad was, get this, his dad was a circus acrobat. So he, his dad goes from being a circus acrobat. And this all ties into Krav Maga. Don't get me wrong. I'm not on a, on a, on a, um, what do you call it? On a tangent. So you got um, Imri's father was a police inspector uh, because apparently in, in, in Czechoslovakia at that time, um, a Jew could be a, uh, a police officer, which is awesome. Um, and his dad was a former circus acrobat who then also owned a gymnasium called the Hercules Gymnasium and was also uh, an inspector on the police force. So that is where he grew up. And that's where he spent a lot of his formative years were in was inside this gym. Um, he became a successful boxer, wrestler and gymnast. And um, I don't know. See, hold on. I'm going to have a sip of coffee. Peter, this episode and this coffee is for you. What up, dog? Mm. So, um, so Imri, Imi, 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 Imi or Imri, Imi, Imi was a wrestler, boxer, gymnast. Okay. So that's, that's, this guy's jacked. This guy's a physical specimen, so to speak. He is the, <laughs> oh my gosh, the 1950s. Um, what is it? The comic book ad, a kick and sand in the. In the, in the guy's face, and then you go and work out. Well, uh, anyways, Imi was the physical specimen. And what eventually happened, as we all know with history, um, eventually there were anti-Semitic attacks on the Jewish community in Bratislav. I don't know much about the Czechoslovakian. I know about the uprising later um, and the uh, the the forces that worked in World War II against, uh, in, in the assassination towards Heydrich. I don't know if they were, I don't know the extent of the resistance in there. And I don't know exactly what the situation in Czechoslovakia pre-World War II was, but it's, I'm saying that because I don't know if they were full on pogroms or if they were attacks, you know, anti-Semitic attacks, riots, whatnot. But what Imi did was he got uh, a bunch of his friends together, a bunch of his um, fitness buddies, wrestlers, all of that. And as these attacks started to happen, they started to fight back. So it's funny because a lot of people love to make the comment, I don't understand why the Jews didn't do anything during the Holocaust and why they didn't fight back. That's Balagan, that's not true. Um, a lot of people did a lot of things, but when you have this massive juggernaut that is the Nazi empire, what, what can you do? Uh, e, e, you know, unless you have something like the United States and Britain who got into the war later, there's not much you can do. 
Um, but there were people who did fight, and Emir was one of them. Um, he uh, he competed. This is before he competed at national and international levels, and was a champion and member of the Slovak national wrestling team. So this guy was up there. I actually know a guy who was on the wrestling team in Israel. Um, I wonder if he knows about this guy. Um, in 1928, he uh, he won the Slovak Youth Wrestling Championship. And in 1929, the Adult Championship in the light and middleweight divisions. And he also won the National Boxing Championship and an International Gymnastics Championship. So this guy was the... Um, Deion Sanders <laughs> fitness. He won a championship in he won a championship in boxing. He won a championship in wrestling. He won a championship in gymnastics. He was a rock star. He really was. Um, and in the 30s, as I said, uh, anti-Semitic riots uh, were were going on in Bratislava. And let me read this. He and other Jewish boxers and wrestlers defended the Jewish neighborhood against racist gangs. You go, boy. Um, now, what happened because of this is he quickly, quickly, quickly find it, found out that, you know, boxing in the ring and wrestling on the mat are totally different than going after thugs in the street. Um Boxing has strategies. It has ways to uh, continue throughout the the different um, uh, what do you call it throughout the different um, rounds. Okay, you want to you want to conserve your energy. You want to hit and you want to hit effectively and efficiently. Um, but in a street fight, you don't want to go rounds. You want it over as quickly as possible. So he had to come up with some adaptations to boxing and to wrestling and to the inherent danger. Because, I mean, boxing is a dangerous sport. Wrestling is a dangerous sport. But there are parameters and stops that ensure, for the most part, that injuries are kept to a minimum, okay? Um, and they call fights if, if if a guy gets, you know, boxing, he gets blood in his eyes and he can't see. They'll call the fight sometimes. You could throw in the towel on one side. You can't throw in the towel on in a, in a street fight. And if you got blood in your eyes in a street fight, the other guy's just going to take advantage of it. So he had to adapt these things and he had to economize um, and make more effective the things the boxing and the wrestling and adapt it to more of a sorry guys vicious um exercise so um in 1935 uh imi uh visited mandatory pa palestine this was during the palestinian mandate with uh with the um uh, with the national team a team of jewish wrestlers Actually, it wasn't a national team. It was a team of Jewish wrestlers. Um, and they were going to the Maccabee Games. Now, one of the things that he wasn't able to compete in the 1935 Maccabee Games because he got injured. Um, I think he broke a rib. And because of this, that wound up being one of the... He broke a rib in training, and that became one of the tenets of Krav Maga, is to ensure that you don't get injured in training. I think uh, a fundamental... Krav Maga precept, do not get hurt while training, which, I mean, that's, that's, I would say that's a no brainer, but I mean, you're, think about what you're doing. Think about what I just said a few moments ago about how you want it to be effective. You want it to be dangerous and you want it to be, uh, you want it to be deadly. You know what I mean? So, um, so he returned to Czechoslovakia, um, and World War II broke out and eventually, uh, I think what was the year in uh, in 1940 with the rise of Nazism in Slovakia because there were fascist groups in the satellite countries that were around Nazi Germany, Romania, Czechoslovakia, 
um, all the majority of these countries had fascist, pro-Nazi um, parties, paramilitaries that were, you know, basically roaming the countryside unfettered, allowed to do whatever they wanted to, to um, Romanis, Jews, uh, homosexuals, whoever. So in 1940, um, he, uh, Lichtenfeld left. He got onto a boat and was shipwrecked in the Aegean Sea. What? And then apparently was rescued. It didn't give too much information on him being rescued. Um, and then wound up serving in the Hungarian pro-British forces, which I, so the British had a bunch of different, not uh, had a bunch of different nationalist units. And I, it, it, it's important you understand what I'm talking about when I talk about nationalists. I, I'm talking about you, they had Polish units. They had Hungarian units. They had um, a unit from uh, Mandatory Palestine. Um, Zev Jabotinsky, he was in uh, 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 he was in a unit, and I think that was during World War One. And uh, but he he served in World War Two and learned a lot, honed his craft became even more of a super duper badass than he already was i mean this guy is just like the uh, is there a movie about him and if there isn't why is there no movie about him so then okay he gets back he comes back to israel all right he comes back to palestine and after the state is this you know and he winds up in the haganah in, in mandatory Palestine. He winds up in what will eventually become the IDF. And he's training units, elite units and the police in this new method that he came up with, Krav Maga, combat contact. And uh, I, I have some information here. He, he trained several elite units of the Haganah and Palmak, um, including the Palyam, which was uh, a special unit, as well as police officers. And he, uh, he eventually, after the, the State of Israel was formed, he founded um, or became the chief instructor for physical fitness and Krav Maga at the IDF, IDF School of Combat Fitness. Now that is at the Wingate Institute, which is up in Netanya, and he, it's world renowned. And the, it's just, this guy is awesome. He's amazing. He's a superhero, was a superhero, um, rock star. And I'm, I'm just uh, blown away, blown away. Um, I think he's still alive. I'm sorry. I never go onto the internet, but I have to, I have to see. Hold on. Yes. He died in 19... He died in 1998 at the age of 87 in Netanya, where the Wingate Institute is. And uh, so he came up with um, this deadly form of self-defense. Now, <clears throat> this is like most martial arts, Krav Maga encourages students to avoid physical confrontation. So you want to not get into it with someone. Um, but when it's impossible or it's unsafe, um, it promotes finishing a fight as quickly and aggressively as possible. And attacks are aimed at the most vulnerable points of the body. And training is not limited to techniques that avoid severe injury some even permanently uh, injuring or causing death to the opponent. And you have to think about the world that, that Emi lived in. Uh, Lichtenfeld was fighting Nazis. Lichtenfeld was fighting anti-Semites in uh, uh, gangs, anti-Semitic gangs. He was fighting fascists. He was fighting against, um, he was fighting against Arabs who wanted to kill him. Um, you think about the, 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 uh, the war of independence for Israel. There were these, 
these people wanted the the blood of dead Jews um, to soak the ground of Palestine from the river to the sea, and that's the, so he wasn't going to take any chances and he wasn't going to let israel take any chances and he should be commended for that um also there is an argument um that it is most moral to effectively end the fight as quickly as possible um so that you can move on so the opponent can move on um i don't know i'm not going to get too much into that and that's probably going to start a fight in itself but um what he, what what Krav Maga did was it had um, principal ideas that were simultaneously to attack and defend, um, develop physical aggression, not to be confused with emotional aggression, um, but with the view that physical aggression is the most important component in a fight. So be scary. Maybe your attacker will go, whoa, I don't want anything to do with that. Um Continuing to strike the opponent until they are completely incapacitated. Okay. Um, attacking, attacking preemptively or counterattacking as soon as possible. So get in there and get it done. Um, using any object at hand that could be used to hit an opponent. Like uh, Jason Bourne using a book to beat the crap out of someone. Targeting attacks to the body's most vulnerable points, such as the eyes, neck or throat, face, um, solar plexus, groin, ribs, knee, foot, fingers, liver, etc. You want to hit those, hate to use this word, sweet spots so that the fight's over quickly using simple and easily repeatable strikes. So this was important because you're teaching brand new recruits in the IDF. You're teaching people in the Mossad who have to learn all of these other things that they have to keep in their mind. You're teaching police officers, you know, who and, and you have a limited amount of time. What is that, two weeks? And you have to teach them an effective fighting system that they have to know for the rest of their lives. It has to be KISS. Keep it simple, stupid. Um, maintaining awareness of surroundings while dealing with the threat in order to look for escape routes, further attackers, or objects that could be used to strike an opponent. It's called situational awareness. It's something that I learned in my years in the military. Um, even though everything's going to hell in a hand, handbasket, you still have to be tactically aware. So this tries to teach you that. Um, and recognizing the importance of and expanding on instinctive response under stress. So you do specific things and you want to behavior, behaviorally change your motor skills so that when bad doo-doo happens, you respond the right way rather than curl into a ball. Um, and training can also cover the study and development of situational awareness to develop an understanding of one's surroundings. Learning to understand the psychology of a street confrontation and identifying potential threats before an attack occurs. It may also cover ways to deal with physical and verbal methods to avoid violence whenever possible, meaning talk shit in such a way that this person goes, man, this guy, you, no thank you. It also teaches mental toughness using controlled scenarios to strengthen mental fortitude in order for students to control the impulse and not do something rash, but instead attack only when necessary and as a last resort. So it is. It's it's putting your finger on the trigger and knowing when not to shoot. It's funny because that's something not and yeah, you could say whatever. But there I think it was uh um it was one of the James Bond, the the two, either Quantum of Solace or Casino Royale, where uh, James Bond says, sometimes it's more important to know when not to shoot. And and that's valid advice. I could tell you that from experience. Um, and knowing when not to get into a fight, knowing when sometimes you're misreading the tactical situation. So all of this is, is hopefully taught and absorbed by uh, it, all of this is taught and hopefully absorbed by the Krav Maga student um, when he's learning this, when he's in the IDF, uh, when he's learning it, when he's on the Israeli police force, when he's learning this because it is also taught there are two different kinds of Krav Maga, I found out 
in my research. One of them is that military style, and that is taught um, to Israeli units, and it's also taught to some people outside of Israel. Someone told me that it was part of combatives training for the United States Marine Corps. It was a component of that. And somebody also told me that uh, Air Force security forces use a form of it. Um, I don't know if that's true. It's what I heard. If it is, it's interesting and pretty cool. Um, but that form is different from the other form, which is taught in the schools that you can go to. Um, and there are Krav Maga schools across the country worldwide where you can go find learn this civilian version of Krav Maga, but just understand from what I know, it's not going to be the same as Shabak, the uh, Shin Bet, or Mossad, or the IDF, or the Sayre, um, the special forces units in um, Israel. It's just not going to be the same because it would be, I think it would be a little bit inappropriate. They need to have that edge. They need to have that little bit more in their toolbox. Um, and it uses, speaking of toolbox, uh, <laughs> it uses core physical defense fundamentals, taking core elements from multiple systems and styles and integrates them into one larger toolbox for self-defense. I wrote that. That's such an awesome sentence. <laughs> and it uses strikes like uh, in karate and boxing. It uses takedowns and throws like in judo, akudo, aikido, and wrestling. It uses groundwork um, as per judo and wrestling again. Um, escapes from chokes and holds like in judo, aikido, and wrestling. And empty hand weapon defenses per aikido. But it also, the strikes, I would say it also uses strikes like in, uh, and this is just from my experience, Wing Chun. Wing Chun uses um, punching strikes that are Oh my gosh, my uh, Sifu, my master, that guy, he would start punching and you would just like uh, jerk away because you didn't want to get hit and they were constant, boom, 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 and they go until the other person either falls down or runs away. Um, but that is a lot, you know, within those those lines of, uh, of ideology that you want to just keep it to be this momentous thing if, if needed, if appropriate for the situation. There could be situations. Isn't that cool? Krav Maga at times doesn't use anything other than your brain. And that is awesome and is what makes it, you know, truly unique and dynamic. Um, the other thing that makes it truly unique and dynamic is that it is designed for everyone. So one of the things that I noticed in a lot of the videos that I saw is that there are a lot of women practitioners of Krav Maga and it's taught to women in the IDF and the police um, and since it's so offensive um, aggressive it is the perfect thing for women to use to defend against attackers um, and again I saw uh, Emmanuel Kadosh was doing these strikes and she's she's just a rock star um, but it really, really is. It is absolutely, um, because of the way it's designed and because of the way uh, it it presents itself in a fight, um, it's a perfect, perfect thing uh, for women who want to uh, protect themselves against an attacker. Um, it also is interesting. Let me take a sip of coffee, and I'm going to talk about this for just one second, then I'm going to wind up. One of the things about it is Israel often gets criticized for how it deals with attackers, people with knives, and how they go and they just, they boom, they shoot, and that's it. So <clears throat> one of the things that I don't know if you noticed when I was describing Krav Maga is that it, 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 it intends to lead to resolution immediately. It intends to do as much as it can to resolve this situation. And, and when I say resolve, I'm not talking about shaking hands and both of us going the other way. I'm talking about ensuring that this attacker is immobilized and doesn't do anything. This is not a sport at all. Um, it may eventually be have a sport component, 
like in civilian uh, Krav Maga, but this is not a sport. This is a self-defense system. This is a weapon. Um, and it falls perfectly in line with the Israeli um, ideology towards dealing with attackers. Um, ensure that you remain. Boom. Sorry. That's just... <laughs> <laughs> That's a worldwide concept, guys. Um, but it's amazing. It's phenomenal. And uh, I, uh, I hope you enjoyed it. All right. That's it. That's it for this episode. Um, if you enjoyed this episode, please uh, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and hit the notification bell. Um, if you want to take this, uh, again, if you want to take this with you, you can find us on SoundCloud, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, and on Spotify. Um, check out our social media. Uh, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and, uh, and Twitter. And it's done. The video's released. The uh, Kickstarter video for the... 12 Cities in Israel, Modern Hebrew Flashcards. It's done. Um, it's up. The Kickstarter campaign's up. I did it on Friday, right before Shabbat. So I can't really do anything with it. I can't promote it or anything. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss a day. Um, but before Shabbat started, someone had already donated $1, which is awesome. And not only did they donate $1, but they uh, I have rewards. So if you do... I think it was 50 bucks, you get one set of cards, uh, 150, you get two sets, 350, you get four sets, 500, you get five sets. I, I, I can't remember exactly the breakdowns, but for $1, you at least get mentioned on the website, the 12 cities in, Abra uh, 12 cities in Israel, uh, modern Hebrew flashcard website. This person didn't even opt for that. They just did it because they believed in the project. Thank you, whoever that was. Baruch Hashem. Bless you. And uh, I, I'm i so excited. Go check out the video. You're going to see it everywhere because it's going to be advertised on YouTube, LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, Instagram, everywhere. So you'll probably get sick of it. But <laughs> invest. Be a part of it. Help us teach people modern Hebrew by investing in our 12 cities in Israel, modern Hebrew flashcard sets. Um, all right, that's it. Thank you so much. Shadi la pera anishar Razor shalti Shali binatati O shadi la pera anishar Me